Welcome to Sketch Notes on a Pandemic. My name is Lucy Johnston. I'm Health and Social Affairs Editor of the Sunday Express. My guest today is Professor Carol Sakura, a world-renowned expert on cancer care. He has advised UK governments, the World Health Organization, written over 300 papers and edited or written over 20 books. I'd like to know why he has spent the last year campaigning on social media in TV, on radio, and in newspaper to highlight the huge collateral cost of COVID to cancer. We'll also find out what drives him and how he thinks we can fix the problem of the growing cancer crisis. If you're interested in this and other conversations like it, please like and subscribe. We have many more guests coming up. Carol, what brought you into cancer medicine? Why are you so interested in it and how did it begin? So cancer is a fascinating disease. It may be strange to hear me say that, having been in it for 50 years, but it's absolutely fascinating. It's the disease of cells, rogue cells, terrorist cells, whatever you want to call them, that break through the very complex control mechanisms of the body. It's like a deviant in society. It's exactly the same thing. Why it arises what are the evolutionary factors that prevent it arising in most of us for a period of time, the inevitability that as you age, cancer becomes commoner and commoner. If we all live to be 200, we'd all get cancer, but we cut off, we leave this world at an earlier point. Have we always had it? Has it always been it's around? It's always been we, there. Yeah. The Greeks had it. They wrote about it the, 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 in, in the, the stones. What are the hieroglyphics in the stones? And uh, uh, the, 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 the 6,000 BC was the first record of breast cancer, for example. I think the problem, why did I get interested? My father died when I was 16 of, can, of lung cancer. And obviously that leaves an indelible memory on you. But I think it's, it is a disease... When I was 16, it looked as though within the next 20 or 30 years then, we'd cure it. Well, we haven't quite. Treatment's got better, and uh, I guess I've seen that because it's too slow to notice it change. It's like everything, it all change, it's very slow. But it has improved quite dramatically. Not only that, it's much kinder to be treated for cancer now than it was when I was a young doctor. We used to get patients into a room. Everyone would come in. They'd be undressed. They'd be seen for the first time. We didn't tell people they had cancer. Can you imagine that? We lied. We said they had an infection. They had a cyst. Uh, they were Why? Gonna, because we, honesty was not part of uh, right, medicine right. in those days. Now we're totally honest. In fact, brutally honest sometimes. I see some poor little lady, elderly lady, that's got a minor skin cancer that we know we can cure. The, the Macmillan nurse is accosting her with leaflets and booklets and tapes all about cancer. So there's no real need. This lady will be fine. Uh, and I think there's almost an overload of information driven by the internet. And people are very confused because of it. Why do you think we haven't got on top of it? What's what is 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 a series of diseases? Is it because each cancer is different? There are a lot of puzzles about cancer, and we don't know why. For example, Mrs. Jones's breast cancer looks exactly like down the microscope, exactly like Mrs. Smith's, and yet they respond differently to the same treatment. So inside the cancer cell are the clues. There are molecular clues. The the genes encode proteins, uh, rather like the dreadful spike proteins on on COVID. I know we don't want to talk about that. (laughs) We'll in a bit. (laughs) We will. (laughs) But in cancer cells, proteins encode molecules that have function, and that function gets changed in cancer, and that allows the cancer cell to evolve to an advantage. It's a sort of evolution in miniature. It's adapting to the changes and to be able to grow in unfavorable environments. So a breast cancer cell can spread from the breast into the bone, into the lung, into the brain, and cause what we call metastases, metastasis, change of place. And that's what kills, the secondary cancer kills. So it's, it's literally a rogue cell that grows out of control And that keeps going. And when you treat that with different medicines, can that rogue cell 
then become resistant? How does that work? Why does that happen? With some cancers, we have very effective treatments and the cells never seem to become resistant. Um, some of these cancers are relatively rare. For example, testicular cancer in young men. When I started in medicine, in oncology, people would present, I remember doing the clinic, and basically if you saw the chest, often it would spread to the lung at the time of presentation. And once you saw that and you knew there was nothing you could do. Within five years, it would worked out the chemotherapy to give that cured something like 98% of these young men. So within a few years, there was a sudden change. Many childhood cancers, again, chemotherapy is very successful. But sadly, the four commonest cancers, breast, lung, colon, and prostate, are not so successful once the disease spreads. Although we do have treatment, and it's almost certainly a matter of tailoring the treatment to the patient personalized medicine, which is a sort of current holy grail. Can you use the molecular composition of the cancer cell to help you get the best treatment for that one patient, the Mrs. Smith treatment and the Mrs. Jones treatment, which may be totally different for each patient. And what do you think the major hurdles are to trying to treat people in that personalized way? Is money an option and how do we compare with other countries in terms of optimal treatments? We're sort of not quite at the top flight. We're sort of just below the, the top. There's always a plateau in medicine, the therapeutic plateau, we call it. So you spend nothing on healthcare, you get no results. You have very poor cancer survival. And as you go up the plateau, you spend more and more money, your results get better and better. You add drugs, you add <coughs> fancy x-rays and so on, radiotherapy, proton therapy and all that. And gradually you end up at a peak which is a plateau. And it, the more you spend, you get no more gain. So if you look at many countries, we're, we're sort of just below the plateau. The United States is way along the plateau. It's overspent. And you just look at lung cancer treatment here and lung cancer treatment in the States where people get three, four, sometimes six lines of different chemotherapy. They're way along the plateau and they're not going to achieve more res better results. What do you mean by results? You mean uh, survival, ex cool. extending society. So do you mean that the survival extension, are you looking at cost and um, benefit? I mean, it may give someone but um, a very short extra uh, extra life or are you saying that it actually you get such diminishing marginal returns that it doesn't do anything really that's the phrase diminishing marginal returns you just spend more money and you get nothing back obviously it's difficult to value a human life in monetary terms but we have with the, within a system you have to it's pointless spending a lot of money trying to squeeze a week or two of very poor quality life out so what you want to do is to make sure someone that's young say 40 or 50, gets the best treatment possible and lives for years rather than days or, or months. And that's the problem. And there are many depressing clinical trials which show a very expensive drug allows you to survive six weeks more than you would without the drug. Well, that's not much of an achievement in reality, especially if the drug costs £10,000. Yeah. Uh, um, I'd rather give the, the money to the patient to take his wife for a cruise, but we're not allowed to do that in the <laughs> NHS. But it's a good thing to think about. <laughs> yes. And, uh, you know, trying to prioritise how to spend money is uh, within cancer does have to involve looking at the benefit versus the cost of any individual treatment. So would you say that you weren't particularly critical of the way we do portion money? Do you think the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, I think it was called, is actually doing getting the balance quite right? Or do you think we have well, some way to go? There is a balance. One could argue that it's too light in certain areas. The one thing we don't do very well is age-related spending. In other words, do you value a life at the age of 80 at the same level as a life at the age of 40. And that's a big problem for society. Um, you know, most countries tend to value a 40-year-old more than an 80. Here, the NHS is not allowed to even contemplate discussions along these lines. We, we can't possibly talk about Which that. Which countries, though? I mean, I know we were going to go to this later, but with coronavirus, it seems that it's been quite a blunt instrument that, you know, we know the average age of death, which you've described, and it seems that those lives have been given priority 
over the lives of people who are younger, perhaps because their longevity, the the death, you know, collateral deaths are down the road, really. And we know that material wealth and mental ill health are linked with um, with shorter lifespans. Do you feel that is a concern for you and that we haven't looked at it in the right way? I, I think one of the difficulties is looking at either absolute death rate from something, COVID or cancer or heart attacks, and the life years lost. So life years lost take into account what I've been talking about, the age of the patient. So someone at 40 would expect to live at least 40 years normally. Someone at 80 would expect to live two years. That's the, the hard fact. Whether we like it or not, that's how it is. So if that's the case, doing something for a 40-year-old, if it's successful, will have more saving of life years than for the 80-year-old, even if it's equally successful as a procedure, whether it's surgery, whether it's fancy radiotherapy, whether it's drugs. And so getting a system in which you attach the value to the number of life years gained from any treatment is clearly something we'll all almost certainly come to. I mean, insurance-based systems tend to do it. Tax-based systems tend not to do it. That's why Europe differs from us. The American way is complex and, and uh, is very much a free market for everybody. So if you were to look at the NHS now, and I know this is a huge subject, what were the three key things that you would try and change? I mean, would you want to actually introduce some form of insurance and especially for older people who are costing us and will cost us more as we demographic? Uh, I- yeah. I think it's inevitable as we go through the... Everybody's in love with the NHS now, are saving our, our whole souls because of corona, slight overstatement, but you know we are grateful that it's, it's survived and everything's going along. I think the problem now is that it can't do everything. It's five million people on a waiting list. Um, try to get an appointment to see your GP. I mean, it's ridiculous. You can't get an appointment within a month for most GPs. Um, they're on call at nights run by £10 oper- an hour operators at 111 following a computer algorithm, which is fine, but it, where's the backup for it all? And then people are, are now being asked to make appointments to go to the emergency room. It's, it's very, obviously not if you've been knocked over by a bus, but uh, uh, you know it's, it's becoming difficult. At the same time, the costs of the NHS are escalating beyond anything that was ever seen before. So I think looking at various alternative models, European systems, which seem to have better access, certainly cancer diagnosis in Europe is much quicker, much easier to get, and it involves bypassing, in many cases, the GP. You just go straight into the diagnostic phase and you get the the key diagnostic for that part of the body. You've talked about cancer hubs for just that, for diagnostics. So having to be able to bypass the GP, which is an obstacle and and wait. So would you think about having people that were just running? I mean, how would you know what you need, what tests you need to run? Would that be through the gateway of the GP or how how would that work? So, So one possibility would be to have diagnostic hubs based on your symptoms, just like 111 does when you phone up with the chest pain or chest infection or spotty child and the the operator follows a computer algorithm you do the same with cancer related symptoms and once you get to a certain threshold of symptoms you're booked automatically for a ct scan an ultrasound Um, even a biopsy could be arranged it can all be done and then then you, you make the appointment to see the consultant. So you bypass that first month to two months and then another month to get the appointment and so on. And the, the problem with the NHS is not just one delay, it's sequential delays. If you get seen in France or Italy, it's very quick. Everything happens within three or four days to get a whole sequence of tests. Here, you get one, you then wait, and then you get to the next one, and then you wait again. And that's the problem with the whole system. Here. But with relying on that sort of system, would that not uh, potentially cause problems if someone hasn't seen you? Surely you need to actually see a patient to... In that, we can bypass that to start with. 
and then you get seen when you have the data. I see. And in a sense, that that's how one 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 operates, and it. You know, I, I, I like to knock it a bit because it is a very cheap way of sorting things out, but it is effective. And because it sorts out, what you need to do is to sort out the, the serious from the non-serious in the quickest, the most efficient, and the cheapest way possible. It's the same with cancer symptoms. You need to sort out those that have cancer symptoms that are real and are due to cancer, yeah. and those that just have the odd headache and uh, migraines and things like that. Not to trivialize them, but you know, yeah. they're not, they're not, you don't really Deadly. need brain scans every, every week to, to check on those. And you don't think you'd end up with the problems that can be related to overscreening, which include um, unnecessary interventions? You would have people that would overuse the system. That's the characteristic of any system which is free and access you see that in general practice i mean in, in a sense what gps have done is learn how to screen out these people but yes and rather than work out why they're so needy but there are people that make appointments regularly they just keep one appointment after the next and keep going back and there's nothing changing and there's nothing being done there's nothing that can be done and that's not what you need for cancer. What you need is a, a rapid way. Someone develops new symptoms that are getting worse. They need to be sorted out. And so bypassing the weight would seem a good thing to do. So I want to talk and just throw it into the future. I mean, hopefully things will improve and speed up. But do you see that there will be, you mentioned to, to me before, about people that may be able to be monitored in their own homes and about... Um, cancer sort of you know oncologists sort of being in touch with people virtually and ways of getting people into the system sort of much more routinely without uh, all the admin I think what we're going to see is a whole use of wearables and gizmos basically for I like example to, what well for example my watch that you can see yeah. here which could tell me my pulse rate my blood pressure my oxygen po saturation pressure well, sadly it doesn't tell me the time at the moment because <laughs> i can't work out how to set the time but uh, it says 701 which thing. it clearly isn't at the moment so uh but gadgets like this and gadgets appropriate to cancer, measuring even blood constitute pro proteins. Do you know any example. at the moment that are in... Yeah, in, there, there's several out really? there. Mm -hmm. And uh, the diagnostic manufacturers like Philips, which make imaging equipment, are developing tests to try and routinely measure blood contents yes. and send the signal to a local computer, which in turn can be connected to a hospital computer. So you can look at things. I mean, yeah. it's been trialed really in cardiac disease where you monitor heart rhythms. You can do the same for cancer and you can monitor various things. So I can see that being the biggest growth area. And so you know, someone that doesn't have to understand how the technology works, but they can follow it. And when I look at my grandchildren playing, my granddaughters playing with TikTok, for example, what they're using there is what we need. We need some sort of gadget that picks up signals. TikTok may not be the best model for it uh, on one side and, and relays them. And this would be the same. And they can be screened and monitored by the hospital staff, basically. Um, so I know you tweeted today that 47 charities have signed a letter of their concern expressing the fear that we may go backwards in terms of cancer treatment in this country. Um, tell me about that and whether you, why you tweeted that. So lockdown has profound consequences, not just for COVID, which is what it's aiming at, but for a whole range of other diseases. And cancer is one of them. And there are several reasons why lockdown results in poorer presentation of cancer, people delaying cancer. And the first one is the patients themselves. They were scared by the lockdown. They were scared by the message, protect the NHS, stay home. They didn't come forward. The second thing is general practice became much less friendly the minute lockdown came. You couldn't see the GP. It wasn't just four weeks. You just couldn't get in. And uh, at the start, certainly, virtual appointments weren't being offered. Nothing was being offered. Then the hospitals, the third thing, was the GPs couldn't refer you to hospitals because they'd cancelled all operations. And then the fourth thing 
is that all the hospitals were completely blocked in terms of the imaging, the operating theatre, the anaesthetists. You couldn't get the first cancer treatment, which is usually surgery. So were they blocked? Did they get stopped? They, they, they were stopped. stopped. They, all the routine operations were stopped. They were stopped again the second time uh, in January. Second time. Uh, and, and hopefully they won't be stopped as a third time in July, which is the prediction, one of the predictions, which hopefully, because of vaccination, will never happen and we'll get away without it. Uh, but we, we can't go through this. I mean, just Was that unnecessary, do you think? I think it's totally unnecessary. Do you? Systems could have been in place to maintain cancer diagnostic services and indeed cancer treatment services. Would that not, I mean, I, would that not have put people at risk, people who already were vulnerable at risk from coronavirus? That is the problem. Would you, some of these patients, because they were going to a hospital, may have a greater risk of getting coronavirus. And they maybe were quite right to stay away. Unfortunately, as the charities know, they've looked at the data. What we can't say at the moment is how many have suffered because of it. How many excess deaths from cancer will there have been because of what we did with coronavirus. And Do you have estimates at this stage? They range from 20,000 to 60,000. If you read Lucy Johnson's excellent article in the Sunday Express, you'll see it's something in the range of 30,000. The answer is nobody knows. And you can't know without looking at it retrospectively next year. When you look at the analysis, you have to wait for the data to mature, the cancer patients to mature, and then you can see how many died compared with two years ago, for example. And presumably these cases will take time to go through. So you could have excess deaths from cancer and indeed other time critical conditions like heart disease into the following year as well. Exactly. And Cancer, although we look at the five-year survival and use that as the, uh, the gold standard to compare different treatments, different countries, different medical systems, the real problem is you just can't predict it. You have to collect the data. So we'll have to wait at least one more year before we can get the real data. Is it possible that we lost more life years by doing what we did than those saved to coronavirus? The, the big difference between cancer, heart disease and coronavirus is the age distribution. So it's much younger with cancer and heart disease than with corona. So the average age of death from coronavirus was 82.5 years, which is way above the average age of people that get cancer and heart. So What's that age? Do you know? It, it varies. With yeah. cancer, it's 64. Yeah. Uh, with heart disease, it's actually 70. So, uh, But there are enormous variations how you collect the data. Yeah. So it could be that we've actually lost more life years, but we don't know yet? These are all factors that we have no idea about and we can only retrospectively look. I and mean, we have to remember, we've never had anything like this. I've never seen anything like this of the pandemic in my whole career. So we've never had cancer services affected. The charities are quite right. Never before, every year, cancer treatments got better. Survival's got better, except for 2020. It's going to be a blip. And probably 2021. Uh, let's hope we can get through this and by 2022 the data will be back to normal successful cancer treatment for most people um did you get frustrated throughout the pandemic in trying to highlight this and what's happened with your efforts to do so has the government been particularly responsive uh, no, they've not been very responsive. I took, a t t took to Twitter, never being into social media. I don't really understand it very well, so I took to it. And I got pounced on by people, I mean, unpleasantly in some cases, uh, about certain things. There's a sort of, uh, Twitter's a strange medium. It's not for everybody, I guess. And I've noticed other people, one of my psychiatry friends told me, you won't like it, Carol, I've come off it. I had to take a rest. And I couldn't work out why. Well, surely no, it's just that. But I could see what he meant. It is a very unpleasant medium, and uh, with unpleasant pe well, people behaving badly. Basically, they wouldn't. If you were sitting in a bar, they wouldn't say these things if they were talking to your face. But it's not like that. And they've, they've, they're sort of showing off and showing that they they know people that they're they're wiser than everybody else. It's very bizarre. From, from 
you know, Piers Morgan to all sorts of people out there that, you know, you just think, surely you can behave a bit better here, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Did it upset you? Did it get you down or are you... No, pro- I'm no. fairly robust. <laughs> I, you know, and you can always switch off. You don't need to open it. In fact, for about three weeks, I just couldn't be bothered to look at it properly. But you had, I mean, you've got, what, 330, over 330 followers now. And I know that even people I randomly spoke to who didn't know I knew you just said that, that you had been keeping them going. So the amount of good you've done, you became known, known as the positive professor. Exactly. Um, it was a bit of fun. Even, even now, when I take my dog Chico for a walk, people know him because he's <laughs> appeared on the Twitter. And they say, Chico and the professor. I say, yes. Yeah. So it was out of sheer frustration that you did that? It was. It was. We thought this would be a good one. So, well, one of my colleagues said, he had a hundred followers, as you say. I now have three thirty thousand followers, and uh, he said, "If if you do this, just write a few moderately controversial tweets, and within a month you'll have maybe fifty or so. You'll never catch up with me at a hundred. And I said, "Just wait and see." <laughs> and and boom, <laughs> yes, and boom. Now he's very jealous of it. You know? Yeah. But, but the um, animosity, I mean, do you think that's partly to do with the frustration that people have felt? And, I mean, you see patients all the time and we've sort of now seeing a kind of rule by with uncertain science and we've yeah. seen the Clapham Common, the frustrations there. And it seems like we are having a set of rules applied. And at the beginning, it was, well, we're all in this together. We don't really know what this virus is about. Let's knuckle down and save the NHS. And this has been going on so long and people don't really know what they're doing it for anymore because so much of it is so uncertain. I don't know whether you feel that's part of what's driving the anger. I think part of the problem with COVID is no one knows what to do, what's for the best. And uh, civil liberties have been totally affected. And I really don't get any enjoyment when I look up a train on the internet to find a train time and I'm told not to travel and all this nonsense I have to screen for. I tried to buy a garden shed the other day. I have bought one now. <laughs> and I had to listen to this drivel about COVID and, and COVID secure and being safe and so on. I just want to shed. I don't need a lecture <laughs> on COVID, madam. You know, it's, it's very frustrating. It is frustrating. But how would you dismantle that? Do you think that some of it is unnecessary? And do you think that we people actually are grown-ups and actually they need helping to understand things rather than fear based messaging to be forced into behaving in a certain way and do you think that's counterproductive that's exactly it, it lucy we've got to avoid this fear-based messaging and you know, we can get out of this is that because of the collateral damage and what you see how it is you see it affects patients or do you think it affects people psychologically as well as a it, as a doctor both. It, it affects them psychologically and it obviously the fear stops them getting the, their normal health needs sorted out. So I, I think the situation is absolutely bizarre. Different people have different levels of belief. And, you know, if, if you ask people, I, I thought the most amusing statistic was the, the 40% of over 80s that have been vaccinated digress from the law. They break the oh, law. Interesting. I didn't see and, uh, you know, fantastic. imagine these good burgers aged 80 dancing oh, on the wow. streets having <laughs> beat, parties and yeah. raves they're <laughs> drinking heavily through the night in their old people's home and you can see this the yeah. disco beat <laughs> throbbing in the care Can't homes join them yeah and exactly Can't, yeah so uh, but but seriously i think the, the problem is we all rebel there's all a bit of rebellion in all of us i think and i think the difficulty is, is how you use force, which you have, if you're a politician, you can use, you have the police to enact the law. Uh, and, and some of it has been truly ridiculous. For know. example, what? I, th- I think the fining for minor d- transgressions and so on, all, all around the place. And I think people are, have had enough and I, it's now time to come out and let's go. And uh, what, right now? I, I think right now. I think the speed of we're getting out of this is too slow. How come I can go and have my hair cut in Newport in Wales, where I'm going next week, because it's legal next week to have my hair cut, and not have it in London? How ridiculous is that? So you mean a lot of the rules are very arbitrary? They're arbitrary. And, and based ma- on? Based on nothing. Nothing. And based on ignorance. by And based on politicians wanting to show that they control something, so that the, the Welsh 
government control the Welsh hairdressers. Now, this is ridiculous. So the idea that you can turn a virus on and off like a tap exactly. is not something exactly. that is based in scientific... Yeah. And, and, and similarly, this the, the international travel, the logics of all this is just horrendous. What, so. with the trying to prevent against the variants? Yeah, I'm trying to prevent it. The variants were something we never expected. You know, when the vaccines came, that was great. Then in December, the variants came. The Kent variant came, the South African variant, and, and the Brazilian variant. And we still don't really know how bad they are. And that's the irony of it all. It looks as though the, they can avoid some of the immune attack on them. But the vaccines still work for all, all three of them. So I think the real world data is quite different from the modelling, isn't it? Exactly, and I think that's one exactly. of the key problems. We've got models, but real world isn't always the same. And, and is it then logical to try and shut out variants if variants are happening all the time? Does it help if you suppress a virus? And I know you've done a master's in uh, immunology, is that right? right yeah. That's correct. So is it correct to try and suppress a virus will stop variants happening? Is that a logical thing to do? Do we have evidence for that again? No, it, it's difficult to know different strategies. If you give vaccines, then what tends to happen is you get variants emerging that can break through. The, they just evolve to break through that the, the immune system. But there's not much evidence that's happened here. And I think although the vaccines are imperfect, they're a really great way of suppressing the illness and therefore the overwhelming of healthcare systems and to reduce the severity and, and therefore the deaths that come with the disease. So they're a good thing. Uh, and I've been immunized, obviously. Well, yeah. But, but so I'm not an anti-vaxxer, but no. they're not, as, they're not the, the most Palacea. wonderful thing yeah. ever. And uh, just as we immunize old people like me with a flu vaccine every Christmas, it's, it's not the greatest vaccine. And we accept that. And the same with this one. And it'll be changed every year to try and make it a bit better. But the most important thing, Lucy, is we try and get out of this situation, this limbo land we're in. I mean, you go out into London now, the cars are busy because people are not using public transport so mm. much. But the shops are empty and closed. Mm. Um, and people are just sort of waiting for something to open mm. up. We should be moving now. The schools mm. are back. That's great. And mm. we need to open everything else up. And I think the vaccines have actually reduced the risk of hospitalisation and death. And we vaccinated all the most vulnerable group. So it does seem odd that we're not moving along with that data, rather instead looking at our numbers and looking at hospitals and variants. In fact, that's not evidence based. The evidence we have from the vaccine shows that we've got that reduction and it's quite significant, isn't it? So really what you would say is that perhaps not wait till July the 21st. Actually, we can start moving now. I think it was June 21st. I hope it was June 21st. I don't know. It might not be. I don't know. <laughs> but certainly, uh, you know, why not just let's move for Easter. Let's just get going at Easter time. At least have a, play outside. Uh, That's yeah. another arbitrary one, do you think? That's another, complete, everything's bit, bit completely bizarre, arbitrary. Yeah. There is no science behind all no. this. The idea of data not... Uh, uh, date date is it's nonsense there is no data you can make it up as you go where did the science come from for lockdown in the first place where what was the protocol it's just it's standard epidemiology you know if you've got an infection you close it down close everything around it isolate it isolate the people the problem with that for this is that you can't do that uh, whatever techniques you use you're not really instituting full lockdown so people are still moving about. They were with the last one. The list of exemptions was many. And, uh, you know, yeah. it's just like with travel. Even now, travel, even to red countries, there are a list of exemptions. And it's not, yeah. it's, 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 it's it's really not worth the effort. No. I think that, that would be my stance on it. But it did work in certain places, didn't it? It worked in China. And do you think our cultural our culture and the way we are would mean that it wouldn't, that same principle couldn't, they had police, didn't they? And they had fed people through hatches in hotels if they were infected. Do you think that's the cultural issue is the one that means that lockdown doesn't really work here? And if we have another pandemic, it's not a way to go. Lockdown doesn't work in Britain. And when we talk about lockdown, it's almost laughable. It's not really lockdown. I mean, you look out there now, there's people wandering around. I mean, for goodness sake. 
Uh, and I think and there always have been. I mean, it's not as though it's, it's lightening up. And right. I think if you dig deeper and find out what's really going on in many parts of Britain, it's, it's life as normal. Yeah, it's, um, because people can't sustain they're, it. They're not. It's just not sustainable. People it's, living in, you know, families living in houses with several generations together. They're not. They're not really in lockdown. No. And so, in terms of just the last last thing, really, but in terms of the NHS. What would you, apart from seeing the cancer, but would you, would you like to see any other thing? If you could just say, right, I'm taking control of the NHS and this right. is what I'm going to do. What kind of, what are the, the key things you would do going forward so that we had a sustainable thing? I think the key thing is sorting out the diagnosis of illness quickly. Right. And if you have to wait four weeks to see a GP, that's not going to be the way in for any diagnostic. Does four weeks make a difference to cancer care? It can do, but more importantly, there are other things that may need to be dealt with within that four-week period that are not being seen. So I think it's unreasonable to have a system that requires people to wait for four weeks. So we've got to get a better entry in. Whether it's run by doctors, run by a computer, run by nurses, I don't know, but we've got to get a better system. And it should involve the GPs. They should be responsible for devising it and advising how to do it. And it should be different in different areas, geography, rural areas, urban areas, and so mm -hmm. on. The problems are different. Do you think we should keep it as it is, with something that's free at the point of need? I think we have to do that. We're, we're so used to that. But universality, though, doesn't have to be tax-based. You can have universal health care, free, at the point of care and still have insurance models, which is what they have in many European right. countries. So you did uh, send a tweet recently about the Girls Aloud singer, Sarah Harding, and praised her for coming forward. Um, she said that she didn't go to the doctors because of the coronavirus. Um, presumably you are highlighting that because you fear that that's happened to many others. I think a lot of people didn't come forward, partly because they were frightened of coronavirus, but also they thought, by not going forward, they weren't going to consume health service resources at a time when it was struggling. So that's not the case anymore. And But she exemplifies someone that had a life-threatening cancer uh, and left it late. Now, hopefully, it can be solved, but who knows what's going to happen. It's always better to catch cancer early. So Roll. with your... Uh experience or expertise in immunology do you think that we may be creating more selection pressures on viruses or on the coronavirus to mutate and to become either more transmissible or more deadly by lockdown is it a given that by suppressing the virus we can reduce the risk of variants do we know that's, that that's a very complex question it is and you'll yeah hopefully make <laughs> but, it simple but you know it's really Immune evasion is what the virus wants to do. It wants to avoid, it wants to keep infecting people that have been immunized, basically, or people that have had the virus before. It wants to change itself so it can carry on reproducing. All it wants to do is reproduce. You know, I'd love to have a chat with the Archbishop of Canterbury about whether the coronavirus has a soul or not. But we know that's all it's trying to do is reproduce. It's just on a mission. Now, everything we do to it, has a it has a counter effect. So if you immunize a population, you change the evolution of the virus. If, you, if you, people start washing their hands, if it, you make the R0 drop to below one, it can no longer easily spread. Um, maybe masks, a minor effect, certainly hand washing, social distancing, all these things mean it's much more difficult for the virus to replicate. So maybe then it mutates in such a way that it can glue itself to the back of our noses easier. It binds better to that. The spike proteins learn how to bind better, so they don't need... They, they, maybe it'll develop ways of jumping distances, so social distancing becomes less important. These are all evolutionary pressures you're putting the virus onto, under. And uh, who knows what's going to happen next? Who knows if there's another coronavirus lurking, a sort of mm. distant cousin lurking somewhere. I don't know whether they're female or male. Of course, they're not. They don't have sexual reproduction. But, you know, let's call them a little girl virus is sitting somewhere <laughs> ready to pounce uh, and, and come out. So I think there's all these conundrums that we don't know. 
Will we all be better prepared for another viral pandemic? Of course we will. There's no doubt we've learned a lot from this. And I think the one thing we've also learned is that if we can defeat it, there's no need to make it take everything. The whole news for the last year, the whole media has been about coronavirus everywhere, every single country in the world. I think the next one won't get prime time. The people will be bored. Not again, they'll say, and we're going to just get rid of it and move on. That would be a good thing. Hopefully we will be more prepared. Um, do you think, though, that the idea that we can, that politicians and scientists can control it once it's seeded then is something we should learn is not possible we just have to try and manage it the best we can because we can't stop it and we can't stop the virus doing what it does absolutely not not letting the virus take control of everything in the country i mean it has been ridiculous to see how politicians all around the world have tried to grab the virus and tried to take charge and what a mess they've made of it in most countries in reality mainly changing their minds changing um, from one ridiculous way to another I mean, our country as well and i think this is not a disease that can politicians can win on it's better to leave it to the uh, the, the public health infrastructure of the country if we had a stronger World Health Organization, they could be relied on to provide information that could help public health infrastructures. Unfortunately, WHO is relatively weak for a variety of reasons and hasn't shown the leadership that's really needed for this. So uh, politicians have taken control, uh, some of them a bit more successfully than others. Uh, and we don't need that. We don't need that for the future. No. So cause, because the data is unclear where we've had severe lockdowns across the world and where we haven't, it's not. there's not a clear picture. And is it true in science? If you haven't got a clear picture, then you can't easily say this works or this doesn't in terms of deaths and lockdown. It's a complete mess, Lucy. And, uh, you know, we, we some countries are isolated by their nature. New Zealand would be one. Uh, and they, they, they've made it their business to isolate themselves, but they've been troubled by it too. So it's not that easy. And of course, modern air travel stops for nobody and people just move. Whatever rules you put, people can get around them mm. and they move around. Migration is part of humanity mm -hmm. at the moment. Yeah. And so uh, it's very difficult. I mean, if you could go back to the old days where you just shut everything completely and there was only horses and carts and so on, you'd contain it, obviously. But now you can't contain it. A car goes from London to Birmingham, you're taking the virus with the car, with the people. So we have to kind of accept that this is inevitable it's and that we have to learn to live alongside it. We have to learn live with it uh, and not worry about it. That's the other thing. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor Sakura. It's been an absolute pleasure to see you and to talk to you and in depth. And uh, yeah, I hope we do uh, start to talk about other things next time. I hope we won't be talking about it and we'll be talking about more important things and not the effect of <laughs> lockdown on cancer, but on cancer as well. Okay, okay. thank you very much. Bye.